Okay. All right, good evening. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. As we normally do, we take that moment of silent prayer, so with uh, that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit so that we can understand the scriptures, so that we can understand your will for our lives. We thank you, Father, for treating us in grace, giving us unmerited blessings based upon the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and our union and identification with him. Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we have in this nation. We thank you, Father, for our leaders. We pray for our leaders, both military and political that you give them the wisdom and the moral courage to lead this country and help us all here in the church to pray for our leaders so that we can live a quiet and tranquil life and that the gospel could be propagated without persecution. Father, we just uh, thank you for the Thompsons opening up their home and we just thank you for the the study in 1 Timothy. We pray that the Spirit can continue to guide us and direct us in this study of 1 Timothy. We pray this evening that you would help those in the audience to concentrate Help them to understand what the Spirit is saying to the church. And we also pray that you would, the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through the communicator, that he would deliver to your people your full counsel, and that they would be built up and edified, and you and your Son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified. And Father, we just pray everything will go sound technically in the Thompson household. We pray the sound will be great on Pal Talk, and there will be no problems with the recordings. And we just pray again that this, uh, this service would be a blessing to the body of Christ and pleasing and honoring to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. So it is in his, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 is where you should be. We're going to study verse 17 here this evening, First Timothy 1, 17. And this verse is going to conclude the paragraph that began in verse 12. Now in this passage in verse 17, Paul's going to burst into a doxology of praise to the Father. And uh, after just talking about what God had done for him through Jesus Christ, now he's going to burst into praise to the Father. This is not uncommon for the Apostle Paul. He does this in Romans 11, 36, 16, 27. Uh, Jude 25 has a doxology. So does 1 Peter 4, 11 and 5, 11. Now you might be saying, what's a doxology? Well, first of all, a doxology, we uh, uh, we get this term, this English term from a Greek word, that is uh, doxologia, and that word is derived from a Greek term, the Greek noun, which we've used, seen Paul use many times in the past, the word doxa, which means praise, glory, or honor. And now, this uh, particular expression, a doxology, denotes a brief description of praise to different members of the Trinity, as we'll see this evening. Uh, most of the time, when the writer is, uh, uh, having a, is giving a doxology, it's in relation to the Father. And sometimes it is in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here we're going to see it's in relation to the Father, and I'm going to point out why that is the case. Because uh, in context, it looks like he's praising Jesus Christ, but there's a few things uh, in the text that tells us that he's praising the Father. So it's fitting. It's fitting that the uh, that Paul would burst into a doxology of praise of the Father after relating to his readers how the Lord Jesus Christ treated him according to his grace policy, even though he was the worst enemy of our Lord among men. So Paul, is, what he's going to do here in verse 17, makes sense because he had just finished discussing, discussing what Jesus Christ had done for him, treating him better than he deserved. Remember, Paul was the most strident, uh, enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. He was the, the greatest enemy of the church on, among men on earth. Remember, Satan in the angelic realm is the greatest enemy of, the, of Jesus Christ and the church. Paul, as a human being, was the Lord's greatest enemy. Yet he was saved. He received unmerited blessings like every single one of us because of the object, the merits of the object of his faith, Jesus Christ. So look at verse 12, 1 Timothy 1.12. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. He's actually emphasizing 
the, uh, the fact that he was faithful because that the Lord empowered him. Remember, that empowerment has nothing to do with his uh, post-conversion walk with the Lord. It talks about the minute he believed in Jesus Christ, he received the, the indwelling of the Spirit, which is the power of God. It gave him the capacity to live the spiritual life and therefore experience his salvation and sanctification. Then he goes on to say with the concessive clause, the Lord did this even though uh, I was formerly, he says, a blasphemer. I slandered Jesus Christ and his church and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. In other words, a, a violent, insolent person. Uh, he, he, the word talks about uh, that he thought he was superior to these Christians. Then he says in the adversative clause, yet I was shown mercy. It's actually much stronger than that. It means in direct contrast to this, I was shown mercy. Or as we saw, the word LAL, the verb there means to, I was uh, I obtained grace is what he's saying. Then he says, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And we remembered, uh, remember in the translation, he's talking about not, he wasn't ignorant of of, of, of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Uh, the, the, the apostles, the prophets spoke of the gospel. This was something that Paul and Israel were not ignorant of. They rejected it in unbelief because they were uh, the rest of unsaved Israel. And Paul was a part of unsaved Israel at one point. Uh, they try to gain the uh, approbation of God or receive, receive justification by keeping the law, meritorious actions, uh, as a result of obedience to the law. And that, of course, blinded them to the fact that they needed Jesus Christ for salvation. So instead of saying, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, we could say, because, because I was in a state of rejection, because of unbelief. He spells it out for the reader. And then he advances upon what he just talked about, uh, that he received grace. He says in verse 14, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant, meaning it was infinitely more than sufficient to handle his problem with sin. Which he, and, he, and he talks, the manifestation, manifestation of, of his problem with sin is found in the fact that he describes himself prior to becoming a Christian as a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor towards the church. So he says, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant or infinitely more than sufficient to handle his problem with sin. And then he says, with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Meaning the, uh, the grace that the Lord gave Paul, uh, it manifested itself in the fact that he walked by faith after his conversion. And he walked in according to God's love after his conversion. And he received that capacity because of his union with Christ Jesus, his, because of his union identification with him. Then we have in verse 15, the first of several uh, trustworthy statements, as we call them. He says in verse 15, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. What's that? That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Remember what save there means. It means deliverance. It means deliverance from many things. It means deliverance from the sin nature. It means deliverance from our personal sins. It means deliverance from being condemned by the law. It means deliverance from physical and spiritual death. It means deliverance from eternal condemnation. That's all tied up in this word, save. And then he goes on to say, among whom... I am foremost of all. And foremost means the most, uh, the, the, uh, the leader of the gang against Jesus Christ. And he brings out the fact, when he says, among whom I'm foremost of all, that statement, that prepositional phrase, is actually giving a, purple, purple, uh, a personal application to his trustworthy statement that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then he says, and here's a personal application. I am the foremost of these sinners. And then he says in verse 16, Yet for this reason, not I found mercy, but I obtained grace, so that in me, as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him in the future for eternal life. So what he's saying there is that Paul was obtained grace from the Lord and was saved and received every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He received that deliverance. He received the forgiveness of his sins and a relationship and fellowship with God because of God's grace policy. And why did the Lord do this? Because he's trying to tell sinners who in the future from Paul and in Paul's day that if he could save Paul, he could save anyone. 
If he could save Paul, he could save Charles Manson. If he could save Paul, he could save Hitler. If he could save Paul, he could save Stalin. If he could save Paul, he could save Jeffrey Dahmer. If he could save Paul, he could save the uh, the uh, the uh, the murderer. He could save uh, he could save the, the the child molester. He could save the homosexual, the lesbian, the drug abuser. The per he could save anybody. He could save Bill Wenstrom. So we can see here that Jesus Christ is using Paul as an example of his perfect patience, which should be an encouragement to Paul and uh, to, uh, to Timothy. And of course, it would be a reminder to these pastors in Ephesus, who Paul talked about early in the chapter, that were apostate and were emphasizing the law, which couldn't save anybody or uh, allow or permit the Christian to experience his sanctification. Only the gospel could do that. So this was a rebuke to those pastors because they were saved on the, on the same basis as Paul, based upon the Lord's grace policy through faith alone and Christ alone. So this statement is almost a rebuke to those guys as well. Then, and remember, because he really wants to, he really is, in, these, in this paragraph, is emphasizing, remember this paragraph in its context, he's trying to give himself as a personal testimony, Paul is, as to the power of the gospel, and that it's superior to the law. The law is that aspect of God's word that condemns the sinner, reveals the holiness of God, and that sinners don't measure up to a holy God. And the gospel is that part of God's word. It's the good news. That's what God's gospel means, the word in the original. The good news that God has delivered us from that condemnation from the law, that the God has accepted us and found a way to save us sinners, even though he is holy and we're not. He found a way through his son, Jesus Christ, to save us. So Paul is uh, trying to show that, uh, in this paragraph that these pastors in Ephesus who are emphasizing the law were totally out of line, and he's given himself as a purple, a perf, uh, perfect example, the best example of the power of the gospel. The power of God for salvation is the gospel. And these pastors in Ephesus were not were failing to utilize that power. They weren't proclaiming the gospel. They were therefore their congregations were people were not getting saved, and their congregations were not growing up to spiritual maturity. That's why Paul is saying the things that he's saying in this paragraph. Now we have our verse for the evening. It says, because after all of that, after this praise of Jesus Christ and his grace policy for doing all these things for him, even though he was the arch enemy of, the, of Christ and the church, he says now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the word now is the uh, post-positive conjunction, the, and that's correctly translated and because the word now is marking a transition from the previous paragraph in verses 12 through 16 to the concluding doxology here in verse 17. So this word, this uh, conjunction, the, is actually, it's correctly translated now because that's the best English word to use to mark a transition. And what's the transition? He's transitioning to what he said in verses 12 through 16 to this concluding doc, doc, doxology here in verse 17. Now, let's look at the phrase. It says, to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. Now, the word king there is the data form of the noun basileps. And then with it, we have the word aeon, which is translated eternal here. And then along with it, we have the word aftartos. And that's uh, translated immortal. It's correctly translated. And then we have aoratos, which is the word for invisible. That word is going to be key because it's going to help us identify who the king is here. Is it the father or is it Jesus Christ, his son? Now, the word basileps means king. It's correctly translated, and it's used with reference to the father. Now, why is that the case? Because if you look at that paragraph, who is he mentioning? He's mentioning Jesus Christ four times, we mentioned. We noted. Well, if, if he's mentioning Jesus Christ in context four times, then why are you telling me, Pastor Bill, it's speaking of the father here? Well, there's several reasons why it's speaking, this word king is reference to the Father and not Jesus Christ. The thing going for the, the interpretation that the word king is referring to Jesus Christ is the fact that Jesus Christ is mentioned four times in the paragraph. So if you thought that's your interpretation, that's, you would have that as evidence on your side. Now, I don't believe that's the case at all, that he's speaking of Jesus Christ. First of all, the, one of the things that gives it away is that he mentions here that this, this king is invisible. 
Now, Jesus Christ is that member of the Trinity who is visible. The Father is spirit. Remember, he said to the woman at the well, John 4, 22 and 23, that the Father is spirit. And spirit means he's invisible. Now, Jesus Christ came to explain God who is invisible. And this is something that's very important for us to understand. He came to explain God, John 1, 18. And also, Philip, I said, Philip, uh, uh, he who has seen me has seen the Father in John chapter 14. So uh, by t- calling the king here and describing him here as visible, invisible, that's actually a great evidence that he's speaking of the Father. So that's one, uh, one piece of evidence uh, on, uh, for uh, uh, Paul speaking of the king here is referring to the Father. Also, another thing that's on the side of being, the king being the Father here, a reference to the Father, is that these New Testament doxologies tend to be directed toward the Father. I mentioned to you earlier and in the past that these doxologies, these, these songs of praise, or these bursting out in praise, uh, sometimes they are directed toward Jesus Christ. But most of the time, they're directed toward the Father. And here's another interesting thing here. When he says, if you look at the verse, it says in verse 17, Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, and then he says, the only God. Now that phrase is actually tipping us off that he's referring to the Father again. Because that phrase in the Greek, uh, monotheo, is actually uh, appears in Jude 25 and Romans 16, 27. Both are a reference to the Father. So when that phrase, the only God, is used, it's referring to the Father. It never is referred to, referring to Jesus Christ. So here's three pieces of evidence here that King is referring to uh, the Father, not Jesus Christ. One, and, and I'm, you're going to say, what's the difference, Bill, that whether it's Jesus Christ or the Father? Well, there's a big difference. There's a big thing that's being said here by Paul, and that's why I'm making a point of pointing, of pointing out who, what member of the Trinity is being referred to here, because it's important. It's an important theological point that Paul is making. So we have evidence for the Father here is that the word invisible tips us off that it's not Jesus Christ because he is visible. The Father and the Spirit are not. The n- number two uh, the New Testament doxologies, which is this verse 17 is a doxology, tend to be directed toward the Father in the New Testament. And thirdly, the phrase, the only God, monotheo, uh, that word is, appears in Jude 25 and Romans 16, 27 in the New Testament, and both are references to God the Father. And then lastly, the fourth piece of evidence is that the Son and the Spirit, they work to bring glory to the Father. Think about that. They subordinate themselves to the Father, and even though they subordinate themselves, that doesn't mean they're inferior, they're, uh, they're equal, but they choose to subordinate themselves to the Father because they want to bring glory to the Father and honor to the Father. Now, this is important here because it's telling us that Paul is connecting the work of Jesus Christ, which he, pray, which he talks about in verses 12 through 16. He's connecting the work of the Father, uh, the work of the Son, to the Father. Because what the Son did was in response to the Father's will. What the Spirit has done, appropriating everything that Jesus Christ did to his death and resurrection, was in response to the Father's will. So Paul bursts in, into a doxology of praise of the Father because he's connecting the salvation that Jesus Christ provided with his substitutionary spiritual and physical death and re- resurrection as originating from the Father. So the, the Apostle Paul wants to make clear to his readers that the Lord Jesus Christ did not provide salvation for sinners independently from the Father, but rather in full compliance with the Father's plan from eternity past. That's why it's an important theological point here. It's showing us that every member of the Trinity is involved not only in Paul's salvation, but the salvation of the entire church. The Father, he's the one who came up with the plan. The Son executed that plan. And the Spirit appropriates that uh, execution of the plan by Jesus Christ. When we have faith in Christ, that appropriates what Christ did for us with his death and resurrection, and the Spirit appropriates for us at the moment of our conversion, through faith alone and Christ alone, the Spirit appropriates, meaning he takes possession for us, everything that Jesus Christ did for us. So that is very important. So every member of the Trinity 
is involved in our salvation, our deliverance over our enemies that I mentioned earlier. Now, since the, the noun aeon is in the plural, remember aeon there is translated eternal, that, uh, and it's not in the singular, it's in the plural. Because this word aeon, if translated eternal, is in the plural and not in the singular, the word doesn't mean eternal. It actually is incorrectly translated. If it was in the singular, eternal is a singular word, is it not? Yes. So that's a wrong word to use here. Uh, at times it is in the singular, and it, it does mean eternal. But here it doesn't. because it's not. And if it would meant eternal here, as the New American Standard has it, that would refer to an attribute of the Father. But that's not going on here. Rather, it's saying that the Father is king over all the ages of time. Because it's in the plural, not the singer, uh, the singular. So this word actually refers, when he says eternal, it actually means the ages. It refers to the dispensations of history, past, present, future, and the eternal state. So we see here, when he says eternal here, he's actually talking about the ages of history, the dispensations of history, the theocentric dispensations, the antediluvian period, the period after the post-diluvian period, the period of the patriarchs, the period of the law, the period of the hypostatic union, the period of the church age that we're now in, that dispensation. And also, it's going to be the case in the tribulation period that follows the church age, and of course, the millennial reign and the eternal state. That's what this word is referring to. It's saying that the Father is going to receive praise and glory and honor from elect angels, and regenerate born-again believers from every dispensation throughout the ages. And this is he's, he's worthy of this praise. Now, this word is used with the word for king there, Vasilefs, as a genitive of time. Now, I bring this out because it affects the translation. Uh, there's different cases. The genitive is one case. The dative is another case. And depending on the case... It's, and especially in relation to time, they can mean different things. So here we have a genitive of time, the word for king, Vasi Les. And that indicates that the father is king throughout the ages, meaning that he is king over the dis dispensations of history, past, present, and future, and the eternal state. So we see when he says eternal, he's not talking about an attribute of a father. He's actually talking about the fact that the father, the king, is going to receive praise from elect angels and regenerate human beings throughout the ages. The reason why it's not eternal, the word's not in the singular. It's in the plural. And the reason why it should be throughout the ages is it's a genitive of time. It's talking about a duration of time here. Now, here we get a great word here, the word for immortal, which we saw is afarthos, afarthos, which is correctly translated here. And it pertains, when he says immortal, what does that mean? It means that you're not subject to decay and death. See, you and I are, and God is not. Jesus Christ, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all three members of the Trinity are um, incorruptible meaning they, they can never decay. They can never be subject to death. They are life. They're eternal life. They've always existed. And so therefore, then, unlike us, and that we are subject to death and decay because of sin. The sin nature, is the re which is in the genetic structure of, of our physical bodies, is the, and it was a, a curse that was pronounced upon us that we have this sin, sin nature. Remember, he said, Adam... Because of, you, because of what Adam did in the garden and disobeying uh, the prohibition to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because he did that, he said, back to the dust of the ground you shall go. That's talking about his physical body. Because when we die, the body goes to the grave and decomposes. Goes back, all the elements that are found in the ground are found in our human bodies. And it goes right back into the ground. And our soul and spirit goes to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, we get a resurrection body as well at the rapture. So we see here that God is unlike us. He's immortal. He's not subject to death and decay, whereas we are. Now, in 1 Timothy 1.17, this word ascribes immortality, immortality, excuse me, which is intrinsic to the nature of the Father. So when we say this immortality, this tells us, it speaks of God's being a, having a, a uh, having that attribute of eternal life. There's no beginning and no end to God. He transcends time. 
that's beyond our frame of reference because we are subject to time. We see things chronologically. God does as well. But also God looks at everything, human history, past, present, and future, and the same goes for angelic history. It's all, all uh, in, to him, happened. It's all, it's a done deal. But from our perspective, our human perspective, it's chronological. It's happening in, in, in a certain chronology. Whereas God sees the whole thing. He sees, look, it's like a DVD. He sees the whole movie. And God, remember, he's transcendent. That means he's outside the time-matter-space continuum. And so, therefore, he's not subject to time. And uh, there might be something, uh, Titus and I have talked about this, but there might be something to the fact when, when Adam sinned, something did happen in relation to time because we're subject to time, and we, uh, whereas God is not. Now, the word invisible, let's go to the next word, because invisible, or oratos, uh, it talks about, it's, it's evidence for the fact that Paul is talking here about the Father, remember, and not Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is visible, and the Father is not, and neither is the Spirit. So the word invisible there is the word aoratos, which is composed of a word related to the verb orato, orao. And that word is a verb which means to see, and it's and we have a negative alpha there, and thus the word literally means not seen or invisible. So the verb in the Greek uh, to see is negated here, and that when you have that uh, that alpha letter in the Greek, it, and you put it at the beginning of a word, a noun or a verb, it negates the meaning of the word. So here, this word invisible in the Greek means not seen, invisible. It's correctly translated. Here, it's used to describe the father. As invisible. Again, that's evidence that the king here is referring to the father. Though the father cannot be seen by his creatures, the son has revealed him. Now hold your place. Look at John chapter uh, 1. John chapter 1, verse 14. Look at John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word, it's a title for Jesus Christ, that means he's communicating the word, actually the, the, the word logos, translated word there correctly, is actually ex expressing the concept that the, Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, the Son, communicates God. He, he's a commu he communicates uh, the truth about God. Now here he says the word became flesh, that means he became a human being. And he dwelt among us. And when we say he, was, he became a human being, we mean this. We don't mean that he, and, and, and uh, uh, we, and I've had discussions with Titus about that. He makes a good point. When we go and say that he added, as in the past, you might have heard me say he added to his deity. That's a, that, can, that can be taken the wrong way. And what it actually, he's not adding to his deity. In a sense, what he did when he had a human nature, when he, when he has this human nature, he clothed himself in this human nature. Although he's not two different people. He doesn't have two different uh, personalities. He's the son, the second member of the Trinity, wrapping himself in a human body. He's tabernacling. It. It's, t it's like you and I going into a tent. He went into a tent, which was his human body, which has now been resurrected and is immortal. So we see he became a human being. He clothed himself in a human nature, and he dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, eyewitness testimony, which makes Christianity superior to all the other religions of the world were just our lies and fake and fakery and uh, uh, like uh, uh, Islam, because we have evidence and witnesses and test eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ is God. Then he goes on to say, the glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, cried out, saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For all of his fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, and grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now look what he says. No one has seen God at any time. Okay, why? He's invisible. When he sees, says God there, he's speaking of the Father. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, Jesus Christ, who is in the bosom of the Father, he the, the only begotten God, Jesus Christ, has explained him. He explained the Father to everyone. Every word, every action, 
was a manifestation of God. Because this God the Son is equal to the Father and the Spirit. And when he became a human being and added to his, his uh, uh, clothed his uh, deity with a human nature, what he was doing was explain, he came to explain who God is. And that's very important because one of the purposes of the incarnation was to explain God to men. Now look at uh, John's Gospel, uh, chapter 14. Look at John 14. Look at John 14, look at verse 7. John 14, 7. Jesus said, If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And look what Philip says. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And look at Jesus' response. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So we see here that Jesus Christ, again, is that member of the Trinity to explain the Father. So when we see, if you can go back to 1 Timothy 1.17, when he says to the king, actually, don't go back. Go to 1 John chapter 4, for, first of all, before you go back to 1 Timothy. So when I say, in, when, when Paul, uh, he praises uh, the king, Who's the king in 1 Timothy 1.17? First of all, he says the king's invisible. That would be unusual for the, Paul to say when Jesus Christ became a man to explain the Father. So he's not going to describe Jesus Christ like that, but he would describe the Father like that. Which is, And we just took, took you to two passages where, which, which teach that Jesus Christ came to explain God. So it'd be, it wouldn't be, uh, it would be unusual. And it uh, wouldn't make any sense, quite frankly, for Paul to say that the king in 1 Timothy 1.17 is the son when, it's actually, when the, the son came to explain the invisible God. Now look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Look at verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. Again, he's speaking of the Father here. If we love one another, God abides us and his love is perfected in us. But notice there, in verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. Now you combine that with John's statements, our Lord's statements, and John's statements in the Gospel of John, we can see that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is that member of the Trinity, who became a human being to explain God. So he is not invisible. He is visible to men. And right now, we don't see him because he sits at the right hand of the Father, but he is in a body, he's in a resurrection body, where the same cannot be said of the Father and the Spirit. Now, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. First Timothy 117, now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, evidence for the fact that he's speaking, the king here is the father, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. Though praise the only God, remember I mentioned it earlier, was, is only used a couple of times in the New Testament, always of God the father. The phrase the only God is the data form of the adverb, Monos, which is translated only. Actually, you can translate it one and only. And then the word for God is Theos, which we've seen many times in the past. Now, this word uh, translated only, it's the word monos, and it is used with reference to the Father here, and it denotes that he's in a class by himself. Or in other words, he's unique, which means that he's the one and only God. So you could actually say to the one and only God. That brings out the idea with monos, the uniqueness of the Father. He's, the, he's unique and he's in a class by himself. So therefore we can translate it the one and only God with the word Theos. Now this word functions as an attributive adjective meaning it's modifying the noun Theos which refers to the Father. Now uh, I want to quote uh, from a man named Towner. Uh, he uh, has a commentary on uh, for, uh, the letters to Timothy and Titus and on page 53 he makes this, uh, the comment 
about this particular statement, the one and only God. What Paul's saying here in 1 Timothy 1.17, and this particular phrase, the one and only God, is actually a, a uh, it's actually a, alluding to something that was mentioned in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6.4, that here, O Lord, the Lord is one. It means that he's the one and only God. He's unique in himself. So Towner says that this particular phrase, uh, the, the only God or the one, only God, the one and only God, represents a fundamental affirmation of belief that go back, goes back to the Shema of Deuteronomy 6.4. What's that? Oh, hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And he says that this became standard theology in the early church. The original affirmation contested pagan polytheism. Polytheism means multiple gods that these people worship. Uh, the Jews came along, Israel came along, and Moses, and they were, super, they were unique because they were not uh, worshiping multiple gods. They were worshiping the one and only God. And so therefore they were monotheists, we could say. And then this guy goes on to say, he says, the original affirmation contested pagan polytheism, which in Deuteronomy was symbolized in Egyptian idolatry. Remember, the Egyptians were involved in idolatry. It was later developed and used widely, widely in the running debate with paganism. In a purely worship setting, this epithet would draw attention to the supremacy of God, end of quote. William Mounts, another commentator on 1 Timothy, writes that the Shema, which Paul's alluding to here in 1 Timothy 1.17, was repeated every day at the synagogue. And, uh, and it still is part of the daily prayer life of the pious Jew. It was perhaps this confession, more than any other, that made the Judeo-Christian outlook unique in the ancient world. End of quote. So when he says the one and only God, or in your Bible is the only God, he's, re he's referring to that Shema that the Jews always talk about and always proclaim and affirm in the synagogue. And Paul, of course, being a good Jew, did the same. So he's actually alluding to the Shema that's taught and uh, uh, revealed to us in Deuteronomy 6.4. So hold your place. Look at Deuteronomy 6.1. Remember, you got Genesis, you got Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those five books are called the Pentateuch. They're also called the Law. Look at, look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is an interesting book. Jesus quoted this Old Testament book more than any other book. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Look at verse 1. Now this is Deuteronomy 6.1. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments with the, which the Lord is God, your God, has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, the land of Canaan, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear, reverence, that word fear means reverence, the Lord your God, hold him in awe, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, and a land flowing with milk and honey. Then here's the Shema. De Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel. Now look what he says. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. The phrase, the Lord is one, is parallel. It's, it's synonymous with what Paul's saying in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, when he uses the phrase, the only God, or the one and only God. There's nobody like him. So when Israel affirmed that, it was actually, uh, they were actually protesting, or con uh, they were uh, contradicting the attitude of people in the world in that time. They came out of Egypt. They worshipped multiple gods. In fact, all the gods of Egypt were actually attacked by the Lord. And remember, demons are behind those the idols of Egypt, and the Lord attacked those those uh, idols with the ten plagues. The ten plagues of Egypt were all directed at these gods, and demons are behind these gods. Now remember that, uh, that Israel, they were going into a land, the land of Canaan, pagans, heathens, 
and they were also involved in polytheism. They were involved in worshiping multiple gods. So Israel, by saying this, the Lord is one, it's saying that he's the only one, and that these other gods are pretenders. They're, they're fake. They're a lie. He is the true and living God. Now go back to 1 Timothy. Go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. 1 Timothy 1.17. You got a gas mask. All right, look at 1 Timothy 1.17. It says, Now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, and then he says, Be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Honor and glory there is, is what we're going to be doing. That's what the creature does. That's what redeemed creatures do. That's what saved creatures like us do. Saved and justified through faith in Christ. That's what we're going to do, be doing and giving and relate to the Father in relation to the King. Now what does it mean that the honor and glory forever and ever? Amen. What does honor mean? What does he mean by that? It's the word teeny and it's a noun. And it refers to, when he says honor here, it means to, uh, to give recognition to the Father. And, and it means that the Father will receive recognition from those sinners, you and I, who are declared justified through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. In our day and age, who's getting all the recognition on earth? Men. And who's behind that? The devil. Men like to, per, like to sit there, and they like to, pro, and it happens in the church, unfortunately. Well, that's where we get the personality cult with a lot of the, with pastors and stuff today and evangelists. And we make heroes out of our Christian musicians and Christian pastors. It's all right to honor a man or respect a man who's a pastor, but don't deify him. And we should be giving recognition to Jesus Christ. In fact, the pastor and the evangelist should always be teaching and, and proclaiming the word so as to bring glory not to themselves, but to Jesus Christ. We need to follow the example of John the Baptist. I must decrease, he must increase. And the more he increases in our life and our teaching, the better it is. Because that is only right. It's just, it's, it's only right, and it's the right thing to do because we're sinners saved by the grace of God. He deserves the recognition. I don't deserve any recognition. If the Father and the Spirit and the Son decide to give me recognition at the beam of seat, that's their, that, that's between their judgment. But my job and your job and the church's job is to build up and, and to build up and give recognition to the Father. See, coming to Bible class and learning the Word of God is a means to an end. That means God just doesn't give us our word, so uh, give us His word, so that we can become intellectually uh, stimulated. Which it, the word does intellectually stimulate us. It's not so that we can get be arrogant and think we know more than somebody else. No, it's to use that information one to do His will, of course, and the other thing is to worship Him, to think about Him, to praise Him, to thank Him. See, the more you learn about your, your you and I learn, learn about our so great salvation, it should result in us responding to Him in worshiping Him. What does it mean to worship Him? It, first of all, it means to respect Him. It means to sh hold Him in awe. It means to show, uh, be, uh, have reverence for Him. Sh and reverence means to hold Him in awe to, and to respect Him. And so that is the, uh, the means to an end. The Word of God and the, and this, uh, is designed so, uh, to give us information about our salvation, to give us information about who God is and Jesus Christ and the Spirit, and so that we can respond and Say and give off of them recognition to praise them for what they have done for us. So this word honor refers to the, the public acknowledgement of the Father for from his his uh, the sinners like you and I declared justified through faith in Christ, and we were saved based upon the merits of our faith in Jesus Christ. So when he says honor here, he means that we're going to publicly acknowledge the Father. We're going to do that at the bema seat. We're going to do that in heaven. We're going to be doing that throughout eternity. We're going to be showing, uh, giving recognition to not only the Son, but also to the Father. Remember, the Father originated the plan that the Son executed for us during His first advent. Then we have the word glory, which is similar to honor here. The word glory here is the word thoxa. 
We've seen this before many times. Here it refers to the adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving that will be directed towards the Father by both elect angels and born-again human beings. So therefore, we can see here with these two words that the elect angels and regenerate human beings, born-again human beings, will be in eternity future giving the Father glory as expressed through adoring praise, honor, recognition, and worshipful thanksgiving. Why? Because he is the source and sustainer and ultimate goal of all things, and he's our Redeemer and our Savior. Hold your place. Go to, uh, go to Revelation chapter 4. Go to Revelation chapter 4. Look at verse 1. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be giving recognition to the Father. And even on top of that, we're going to give him adoring praise and recognition, worshipful thanksgiving. We'll be directing that towards the Father. We'll be singing to him songs uh, that are, are express our appreciation for him. So that's one of the things that, one of the great things to look forward to. If you can't sing now, you're definitely going to be able to sing when you get your resurrection by, when we get to heaven. Because that's, that voice he's going to give us is designed to give him praise, not curse men or curse God. God gave us a mouth and the lips that we have and the voice that we have, no matter how bad it is. He gave it to us so that we could praise him, so we could thank him. And that's what we should be doing with our lips. And look, in Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we have, a, two, we have some scenes going, here, going on here and that uh, are actually speaking of worshiping Jesus Christ and God the Father. Look at, uh, look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After the, and these, these are all subsequent to the rapture of the church. Remember, we see in the first three chapters, the church is on earth. And after that, the church in verses 4, 5, and the rest of the book of Revelation... Uh, except up to, uh, excuse me, up to chapter 19, the church is in heaven. And in Revelation 19, it comes back with Jesus Christ that is second advent to end the tribulation period. The church is, according to Revelation 19, 1 through 7, is married in heaven prior to, uh, while the tribulation period is going down. So here we have Revelation 4, 1, and we have a great scene of worship. It says, after these things, Revelation 4, 1, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I have heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardis, it was sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. You can compare that with Ezekiel 128. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. It's a representative of the church. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Seven is the number of spiritual perfection. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center, around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And the first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, these are angels, each one of them having six wings, say we have, and the six wings, the wings are indicative of rank. These are uh, seraphim. You can compare them with Isaiah chapter 6. They are cherubim, they are four-winged angels. The six-winged angels are higher in rank. So he's, we have the seraphim here. They had seven, uh, six wings, uh, full of eyes around and within, and day and night, what do they do? They worship Jesus Christ. And they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne to him, uh, throne to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O our Lord and our God, 
to receive glory and honor. Same two words that we see in 1 Timothy 1.17. And power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. Look at, keep going, look at Revelation 5.1. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book, written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Now, who's sitting on the throne? The Father. The Lamb, the Son, is going to take the scrolls from the Son, the, the one on the throne, the Father. And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly. No angel could, because none of them were worthy, which implies that the angels fell as well. Look at verse 4. Then I began to weep greatly, because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb, speaking of Christ, standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came, and he took the book out of the right hand of him, the Father, who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And look what they do, they worship. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. It says, And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne of the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads upon myriads, thousands of thousands upon thousands. You couldn't count them. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them were saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, to the Father and the Son, He's not, the Father's on the throne, and the Lamb there. Be blessing and honor and glory. Honor and glory. Same two words that Paul uses when speaking of the Father in 1 Timothy 1.17. Honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And that's what Paul's doing here in 1 Timothy 1.17, which you can go back to. He's worshipping the Father. So go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. First Timothy one seventeen, and now we have a, a phrase here which says "forever and ever," which speaks of eternity. It speaks of eternity future. Look, what he says in First Timothy one seventeen, he says, "Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, or we could say the one and only God, be honor, recognition, and glory, adoring praise and thank, worshipful thanksgiving, forever and ever." Amen. Forever and ever is a prepositional phrase. We have the preposition is, and then we have the repetition of the noun aeon. And the word aeon is used twice in this verse, and it's translated forever and ever. Now, this word means ages or eternity, and it's used with the preposition is to express the concept of eternity, and it literally means throughout eternity. So when he says forever and ever, he means throughout eternity. Here in verse 17, we have Paul repeating this noun, aeon, which is articular, and it literally means the ages. Now, the preposition is is coupled with this accusative form of this word, aeon, and literally, this prepositional phrase means throughout the ages, and that denotes the extent of time in which the Father will receive honor and glory from those sinners he has justified through faith in his Son. Now, you'll be saying, all eternity, I'll be worshiping the Father and Jesus Christ, and so I can hear somebody, I can just hear somebody, oh, how boring. Oh, really? And if you're bored thinking about that, well, you, you have no idea how much fun that's going to be. See, you have no idea. You, singing is going to, if you don't like singing, you're going to like it when you get to heaven. You're not going to have a sin nature. 
You're not going to have a sin nature. You're not going to have the devil. You're not going to have your problems to deal with. You're going to be released from all of that, and you're going to be free to worship him. And we don't even have, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man, the things that God who prepared for those who love him. First Timothy chapter 2. So we have only, we don't know what we, God has in store for us. That's a bit of a secret and a mystery. But it's going to be absolutely amazing. And we're going to have reasons. I mean, we need us. If we can't enjoy praising God and worshiping God and thanking Him, okay, there's something wrong with our relationship with God. There's something wrong with our relationship with God. If we don't take the, the things that we learn should cause us, and the things that we go through and with God should cause us to thank Him. I can tell you right now, in this ministry, I look at the things, and Titus, you. You, got, you, can, you can vouch for me here, and the little guy here too. But we can, the things that God has done for us, it's just absolutely astounding. I mean, I mean, sitting out there on the backyard when we had lost everything, was, ta- was just blown up. And to see what God has done, I mean, I, 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 was, I was sitting there today thinking of all the answered prayers. I actually, you, know, might, you might laugh at this, but I, I'm looking at the, uh, this couch I have in my apartment, which Titus was, is used very well. Okay, and it, I always wanted to have a decent couch and a recliner, you know, a recliner. Well, not only did I get the couch, but I get the recliner that goes with the couch. And I, you'd say, oh, that's no big deal. Well, I thank God. I prayed for that for a long time, and I got it. And I, and I just one thing after another, these the answered prayers. Well, you know what? You should take think about that and thank God and worship Him and say, man, thank you, Lord. You know, when you say, you know, we, when we talk about, you know, great athletes or great musicians, we, we, we heap in, or our parents or, you know, friends, we heap it, or our loved ones, we heap all these, you know, things about, our, like, for instance, our, you know, people we love, and, or the girlfriend or the wife or the boyfriend or the husband, and we, we heap all this, these, you know, this uh, uh, praise on them. Well, you know what? How much more should we do that for God who gave us our loved ones? You know, you think about... Um, and truly, I can look at and everybody can look at their life. I'm, I'm, ble- I'm blessed. I'm, bl- I'm blessed. In, I'm blessed through adversity. You know, and, and, and thank God that you know that, that you you have to just thank thank Him, and that's what you're going to be do, doing for all of eternity, throughout the ages, because we're going to look back where we were. I mean, think about Paul here. I'm the worst enemy of the church, and yet here I'm going to be living with God forever, and I get blessings I didn't earn and deserve piled on top of another. I'm going to get a resurrection body. I'm going to be immortal. I'm going to have rewards if I'm faithful. And he was faithful. So he's going to have all these rewards. He's going to get that eternal inheritance. And I, again, he doesn't know exactly. He knows now. But I has not seen, ears not heard, nor is it entered into the heart of man, the things that God, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So you're going to, the things that God has done for us should cause us to worship him. Not just in the future. But now, see, the worshiping of God the Father and the Son should begin now. And the material the, uh, that we have is in the Bible. And the, the, uh, the motivation is what God has done for us. We don't deserve anything. We totally have no merit with God. We deserve the lake of fire. Yet that's not where we're going. So we, this phrase, forever and ever, speaks of the concept of eternity. The twofold use of this word aeon emphasizes the concept of eternity. The word is a, it's a genitive of time, and it actually speaks of during the ages because it's a genitive of time. So here we have forever and ever speaks of eternity. And then we have the word amen, translated amen here. It's an interjection. What does that mean? When people say amen, well, it emphasizes the certainty that God the Father will throughout eternity, future, Receive from regenerate men and elect angels, honor and glory. So we can translate it like this. Look at verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the one and only God, be honor and glory throughout eternity, so it will be. He's that phrase, amen, translated amen. Amen means it will be. It's an affirmation that this will take place. And as we close, listen to what William Mount says. It's a great statement. And I'm quoting from him. In coming ages, the songs of the redeemed will ring throughout the court of heaven. 
redemption will be complete. The eternal purposes of God will reach their fulfillment. God will be forever praised. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us and encourage us and instruct us in the things that we've learned here this evening and rebuke us, rebuke us if necessary. We pray that this class would be a blessing to the body of Christ that build up and edify the body of Christ and bring glory to you and your Son, Jesus Christ. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.